Hello everyone and welcome to one of my Armored Core Project Day build videos. This time we'll be talking about heat cannons. But first I want to say I wasn't able to get up an Armored Core Frantic video because uh, there was a series of unfortunate events as uh, is one way to put it. And so members of my family were sick and so on Friday I couldn't record because people were home and in the same room as me and I don't have any RBC or space to record. And on Monday there was a holiday so I couldn't really record that either for the same reason. So then, uh, so yeah I decided not to really upload it because also on Tuesday I was kind of busy and tired of doing other things. So today, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, heat cannon weapon arms uh, more specifically. And so heat cannon weapon arms are pretty cool and it basically lets you dual wield cannons. And who doesn't like dual wielding giant cannons? And so, heat cannon weapon arms are really cool in that they do lots of damage very quickly. So you're dual wielding them, so obviously you're doing tons of damage. And they are pretty good at punching through almost any armor in the game. The only problem being that uh, they're pretty short range due to having a very low muzzle velocity. And they can't really do too much against lighter targets, really, because they also have moderate lock on speeds. Also, at the end of this video, I'll be having uh, some PvP footage, which I'll be talking over because I was actually able to get PvP footage this time. Isn't that amazing? So, for these heat cannons, like I said earlier, they do really large amounts of damage very quickly. Uh, there's two of them, and they're short range. So, we'll take a look at some of their stats. So. Uh, because they're weapon arms, you can tune them, and the heat cannon weapon arms are rather unique in that they accept a variety of tunes, although there are basically two good tunes that people use. So the main uh, the main tunes that people use is one power, two accuracy, or uh, zero power, three accuracy. Three accuracy is more common because it's a little bit more accurate and so people like hitting things. I personally go for the one power, two accuracy because of a few specific scenarios where the three power just, or the three accuracy just doesn't cut it, because if you look right here, so right here the three power or the three accuracy one is on the right, and the one power two accuracy is on the left. The three accuracy one does a little bit less damage, but has higher muzzle velocity and slightly better lock-on time. And the muzzle velocity is actually a pretty significant improvement. And while the attack power doesn't seem like a big drop from three hundred three thousand three hundred to three thousand, excuse me. It's big enough that um, certain tanks can block 3000 one, or 3,091. Most tanks can't block 3,352 without just being a really unviable tank build. So since these weapons are primarily anti-tank anyway, I went for the slightly improved power to make sure I can destroy all tanks. It also improves the ammo efficiency a little bit by making it so it takes fewer shots to kill the same target, which is kind of important because these things, while they're very powerful, they only have 72 shots. And since you're dual wielding them, you're firing two shots at a time, so you actually only have 36 shots. And since these things are going to be the main weapon of this build, you want to make sure your shots count. The, um, the optimal range is not really important because that's well within the range that you'll be using these things anyway. Uh, the main features of these things is that they have actually have moderate TE defense and very high health, which is pretty useful. Although the TE defense not quite as much unless you have a certain type of build because since these things are uh, since these things are so short range you need to get in close and builds that can get in close are usually fairly light so it's hard to take advantage of defenses on builds that have to get in close. However, since these things don't weigh nearly as much as the um, or the AS missile arms down here, I mean they do weigh comparable amounts but it's still not quite as much. It's enough of a difference where you can actually put some armor on you can put a little bit of armor on a build that has these things which is nice All right. also since uh, turning is important I went for these fisherman leaks but what else can I say about these things I mean so like I said they have high health they have okay-ish defenses for what they're good for and they don't weigh quite as much or consume quite as much energy as some of the other weapon arms they also hit really hard as I will keep as I will continue to mention because it's true so then, because they're weapon arms, you can't use subcomputers with them, which is not too big of a deal because they have okay-ish lock-on speeds anyway. The main issue is that you can't bring more ammo for them, and you also can't, um, 
bring missiles to complement them or anything like that. So you're very limited on your options for fighting lighter units that can dodge these things all day. So you either have to get good at hitting or you have to bring uh, arm weapons that will handle lighter units pretty well. So you have to you have to make a lot of choices about what kind of weapons you want to bring alongside these things. So right here on the arms I have two pulse guns. I chose these pulse guns because uh, most lightweights have a hard time if not can't block out these pulse guns and it also helps against quads and heavy rush joints which typically resist if not block these um, heat cannon weapon arms. Although they still usually don't because 3,300 defense is kind of a stupid huge amount. Like most quads stop at about 2,800 to block out Shikosas and that's on the high end. Whereas tanks, you could make an argument for tanks to go above 3,000 to try and block out uh, these things because you know uh, these things are kind of dangerous to tanks. You see someone on the enemy side that has this and if this dude, if the guy holding these heat cannon arms doesn't die then the tank will die because this thing will eat tanks a lot. Now mind you, p piles and other such anti-tank weapons are just as effective but this thing is an effective weapon that will... Tanks pretty much have no way of really dealing with this thing as is uh, pretty easy to point out because they just don't have the defenses to block it out and they don't have the bulk to outlast it. So they get eaten alive by these things. Also, I want to make a comparison between the WAV P08, also I like to call it the Wave the Wave 8, because I don't know, that's just what it looks like to me, compared to the 3, or the Wave 3. So, the 3 hits harder, but on the same tune, or actually no wait, where's the other tune, oh, there it is, so on the same tune of uh, 103, or 102, damn it, I can, I can speak, so the first generation version of the Heat Cannons, um, have less health, less armor, they weigh less, which is good, although it's not really a big difference in weight, so it's kind of negligible. The, the difference in armor is actually worse than the difference in weight. And they hit way harder, as you can see. 4,200, nothing in the game is going to block that out, no matter how hard they try. Like, I'm pretty sure nothing in the game can block that out. The only problem is that they also have, like, half the accuracy, and they're slower, and have less ammo. So, when you have really high damage and low ammo, when you have really high damage, low ammo, and low accuracy, and that's basically a recipe for disaster and that you're gonna you're gonna miss enough shots that you're not gonna be able to kill someone so these the way three they're really hard to make use of you could try to make it work but it's very very difficult and they're just usually not worth using they look stylish though they have different styles uh, when you have them equipped the wave 8 has like a sort of an asymmetrical design whereas the wave 3 has more of a symmetrical design so if you like if you're building for style then there's a valid point there which is pretty cool. Uh, I also like that they have like the big uh, drum magazine on them to carry all their ammo, which is pretty nice. And what else can I talk about with these things? So, um, the good thing is that unlike the missile arms, because they uh, don't require too much outright speed and it's more focused on your turning slash jumping ability, you can you have a little bit more variety of what legs you can use. So like here I was actually spent a while trying to decide whether I wanted to use the fisherman legs or the forehead series for more defense or the um, LRB legs for more turning. Now the LRB legs do offer more turning and better defenses but they also give reduced speed and so I didn't feel it was worth it because on this build I'm actually running an acceleration type booster for prolonged boosts so I wanted to get more out of it. I also chose this particular booster over the Shinatsu booster just because I kind of like the way it feels a little better even though the Shinatsu has slightly better high boosts. Um, I like the uh, 214's uh, acceleration time. So if you look at the high boost acceleration time of 7 versus 5, that means that for like however long, basically I don't know how much that exactly is, but that means that the booster is going to be active for 7 units of time as opposed to 5 units of time. So the 348 high boost here is going to be pushing me for 7 units as opposed to 352 pushing me for 5 units, which means I'm going to cover a little bit more distance with the 214 as opposed to the 309, which is pretty nice. So the um, the 309 will give you a very short powerful boost, whereas the, three, the 214 will give you a slightly longer but slightly weaker boost. But um, slightly longer boosts are more important in my opinion. As for generators, since these things don't really feed off of um, energy too much, I kind of just went for a high output generator because it lets me get a more or less continuous boost. I could go for this one, but I don't like that booster. I just I don't like it. It's not that great. I mean, it, it, it it's great, but it's not 
it doesn't have any soul. It's a very unpleasant to use, from, in my opinion. Now, the big point I can talk about with these uh, weapon arms is the FCS. Because you basically have three options for FCS. You have the FA215, the Glance, which is not a bad option. And the reason being that it has decent range and really high lock speed, which can make the difference if you're trying to lock onto someone very quickly, like if you want a pop shot. However, the problem is that it has a fairly slow lock on, or fairly small lock on size, and that can contradict with the idea of a close range weapon. And against faster targets, you're not going to be able to log on quickly, as I learned yesterday when I was testing this build, and I got the PvP footage for this. Now, the FA303 here, the Yasukani, is a pretty good choice in that it has a larger lock on ring, it doesn't have as much range, but since you're at close range anyway, it doesn't really matter too much. It still has good lock on speed and it has low drain. And the low drain can be helpful when you're trying to boost around in combat mode. But, you know, depends. Now, what I wound up actually using and getting the more or less the best effects out of was the FO3 over here, which is also known as like the super wide angle uh, because it has the largest lock on size in the entire game in addition to having okayish lock computation. If you were to compare it to the E28, E28 has terrible lock computation and still a large lock on ring, but better range that is kind of wasted. Also, since these heat cannon arms conflict with your shoulder weapons and you can't have any shoulder weapons on them, they um, you don't really get any benefit from having a high missile lock computation. So that's why I wound up using the FO3. Or that's why the FO3 is usually a good choice for these heat cannon arms. In addition, because the FO3 is a fairly short FCS, having a head that has a moderate to high camera performance is pretty important. And so this one right here has 762, which is pretty much the definition of moderate. You're going to be getting about, like I think, was it, like a 25% boost to your lock-on range with this head. So 25% of 150 is going to be about uh, 35 or so. So you're going to be getting about 180, 190 lock-on range with this particular head. I wouldn't recommend going for a head that has like very very low computation or very very low camera because you'll be missing out on some of that range and that can be important when you're fighting at mid range against someone who's running away from you. Long camera is nice but not necessarily necessary for this build because again you're fighting in close range primarily but when you get into that mid range because you're forced to by an enemy who's faster than you then you have to. You have to have that mid range option otherwise you just won't be able to lock on in time. Because someone will be, because it's very possible with this FCS for someone to be sitting outside of your lock-on range, and then if they're sitting outside of your lock-on range, then you can't lock on until you get into range. And so if they can get out, of, if they can stay on the edge of your range, then they can fight you comfortably, and you can't lock on. So it's important to have enough range. Yeah. I also chose this head because again, it offers a very good balance of stats across you know all of its stats. It has decent armor, decent health decent stability, decent camera. Everything about it is decent and it overall makes it a very useful, very versatile hit. It also looks cool. And it gives me enough defense to resist um, rifles, which is good because rifles would eat this thing alive at mid-range. Core, I went for this because it has decent health, decent bulk, which is pretty useful. Although you could easily go for this, for the slightly increased, uh, the slightly increased defense, or you could go for this one which will be a little bit lighter, but the main reason to go for this is actually because the energy conductivity is lower, which is kind of a boon for this AC, if you're trying to build it in a specific way, because it would give you slightly... What it is is that um, higher energy conductivity increases this, or this, the acceleration of your boosters. And if you notice when I was talking about the booster timing earlier with the 2, 214 versus the 309, the, um, the time that it takes for the booster to accelerate you is listed as like a high boost acceleration time and so having a high energy conductivity actually reduces that time to make it a little bit more responsive a little bit more efficient but when you already have like a super efficient booster from an acceleration booster then that means that you're actually going to be reducing the distance that you travel without really making yourself any more responsive and that's kind of an issue so here because you're reducing the efficiency of the booster you're actually making it so you travel farther which is kind of a good thing might be you could go for this one which has better defenses and you know, has those big stylish blades on the front, but uh, 60 energy conductivity is a little debatable for the most part, so I'm not sure if you want to use that. And also, since both of these are lighter, they would improve speed and turning slightly, so you could easily go for one of these. They're pretty stylish looking cores too, so you have an, an option of either of those. These cores I wouldn't recommend because while they have really high recon counts, 
they don't have they have very low health and very little armor and so you're going below the point where rifles would hurt you without really getting the benefit of having the uh, longer boost duration legs you have a few options there's the fisherman which I mentioned if you adjust the weight a little bit you can get the forehead to work and you can build a fairly tanky uh, light reverse joint because this the, this obviously increases your TE defense to levels where uh, pulse machine guns are not really a threat anymore although at pulse machine guns will still be a threat uh, the only problem is that you um, you have to adjust the weight because uh, you, these don't quite carry it. Also, the forehead legs is slower. The LRB set is going to give you more of a balance between the forehead and the fisherman, be, be giving you decent speed, really high turning, and good defense. But it's not quite enough defense where you'll be blocking out uh, pulse machine guns, but it's still enough to give you some defense against them. If there's any other parts I can talk about, not particularly. I mean, recons, recons are really all user choice. If you go for a core with a high number of recons, you can go for these. Although these Asatori 3 are pretty standard among most people. You can also go for uh, sticky type recons, if you want to play more of like an ambush role. But that depends on your personal preference. So then, is there anything else I can talk about? Not really. So we'll go in. I mean, I guess I can talk about like alternate leg types. Uh, medium and light white bay puddle legs handle these uh, heat cannon armors very well. Reverse, heavy reverse joints, not so much. I mean, they can do it, but it doesn't work quite as well. And uh, heavy bipedals can do it pretty well because they can just use their bulk and speed to run in and just keep going. But they're also kind of a they're also kind of vulnerable to attacks at that point. So then, now I'm going to show you. I'm not going to bother showing you the lightweight because that's something that's going to be in the PvP footage. So that's, I'm not going to bother showing you this. But I will show you against the tank. Just so you can see what happens when tanks come up against these heat cannon arms. Because they're kind of dangerous. Also, heat cannon arms make a pretty satisfying sound when you fire them. Which is kind of nice. Also, this particular combination of booster and generator gives me, like, semi-perma-boost, which is pretty nice. And, since here, since the tank is pretty, whoa, oh damn, <laughs> the tank does not want to have any of my shit today. Okay, well, I guess we'll have to try again. That's kind of a waste of time. Also, my PS3 is suddenly kicking into overdrive with its fans, I don't know why. Sometimes it does that, seemingly randomly. I wish I could get the fans to quiet down, but whatever. It doesn't come up in the recording too much, so. So, what I was going to say is that a pretty standard way to use these things is to boost around everywhere like this in glide boost mode. And if you have the widest lock on in the game, then the reduction to your lock on uh, ring because of the glide boost being in effect isn't quite as bad. Right? Also, the AI is really good at tracking you, and the problem with using perma uh, boost is that um, you're easier to hit because you're moving in a consistent pattern. And so the main the main reason the main thing you'd want to do here is basically just use the glide boost to get behind your target. Then you can cut your booster and fire from behind them. Also, second staging is kind of important with this build. It's not always important, but on this build, it's really important because it lets you get good efficiency while still maintaining decent speed. So right there, it only took half my ammo to kill that tank. So that means I could easily kill two tanks with this setup. Alright. And that was a tank with a fair amount of health. I think it has like, what, like 45,000, 50,000 health? And so the main advantage to those heat cannon arms is just that they punch through all armor and tanks are sitting ducks when they don't have enough armor to block your weapons. And since no tanks are going to have enough armor to block out these things, all tanks are sitting ducks to you. Excuse me? Most quads as well. Oh, it's not going to be quite as effective. Because quads will resist it and will take a little bit less damage. But right there, I was able to hit him with... Uh, each of my double shots was able to do about three to 4,000 damage per hit. So, if you have 50,000 health, then I would have to hit you about... Let's see. Let's do some math. About... 
15 to 20 times, 15 to 16 times basically. And that would be enough to kill pretty much any tank in the game. So it's going to take you about 32 shots to kill most tanks. So that's pretty good. And extreme lightweights, while they're going to have an easier time dodging these things, they're also going to have a lot less health. So when you do hit them, you're basically going to be able to like three shot them with these giant ass weapon arms. So that's kind of important. So on average, yeah, you're going to get about two tank kills per game. Or you can kill three heavies or four lights. And you might be able to kill two quads. I don't know. So now we're going to talk about uh, weapons and stuff that pair well with these things. Because you know, there's a lot of you have a lot of options. Since they're fairly heavy, you don't have too much weight to play with, but you have enough weight to play with where you do have some options. Uh, Neodori 3 is a very good pulse gun in my opinion. It hits really hard and it doesn't cost too much energy. Uh, Neodori 1 is not bad either because it costs less energy and uh, yeah, it costs less energy, but it's going to do a little bit less damage. Uh, the R31, also known as the Mahaon from the previous game, is a pretty good pulse gun, but it's going to do less damage, it's going to cost more energy. Now it looks like it's doing more damage, but it actually fires four at a time instead of six, like the uh, Neodori models, which is kind of an important number to look at. Simultaneous rounds right there is a very important stat for these pulse guns. But um, so the R31 is going to do more damage for puncturing through armor, so you're going to be able to hit all pretty much all midweights and uh, all lightweights with this thing without having to worry about them blocking out your armor. It's also going to be very effective against quads, but against things that block out neither the ma uh, the 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 Neodori 3 is going to do more damage and cost less energy, so it's going to be more effective in combat. Uh, these things are kind of silly. They're, they're, they're very silly. Uh, the, your other option is actually the Kingfisher and the Knuckle. Now the Knuckle is basically kind of like the extreme version of the Neodori 3 in that it does really... It does a little bit more damage per shot, but it also fires 8 shots at once instead of 6, as you can see by looking at the simultaneous rounds number. However, it also costs a large amount of energy and is very inaccurate. So if you can get in g close with these things, the knuckle will actually do really good damage and will serve you well. So it's a pretty good uh, pulse gun, but you have to figure out how to make it work. The Kingfisher is if you want to uh, get slightly more, if you want to get something that's slightly more efficient. Um, the Kingfisher is a little bit slower than knuckle, but it also doesn't cost quite as much energy, which can be important in some scenarios. Because while it's uh, the difference is only sorry, this one costs eleven thousand one hundred, whereas this one costs eleven thousand seven hundred. The difference between them is basically that. Uh, when you're dueling them, it's going to be another 2,000 energy or so that you're losing out. And 2,000 energy isn't a ton, but when you're running a uh, high output generator, it can be enough where it's important. So it's kind of personal preference. Now if you compare that to the Neodori 3, which only cost 8,000, then the Neodori 3 is very efficient for the amount of damage it does. The Knuckle also doesn't have too much longevity because it's, it fires 8 shots at once and it, goes, it only has 120 ammo. That means you only get uh, 15 shots, whereas Neodori 3, you get uh, you get 30 shots, I think. So the Knuckle is a really good option for doing a lot of damage very quickly, but you have to know its drawbacks. So there's that. Uh, the other pulse guns, like these uh, high high ammo capacity ones, and the R21 is not really worth using because it gives up the damage of the R31, but doesn't really have any of the doesn't really get anything because if we compare the R21 to the R31 R31 is going to be a little bit more accurate it's going to reload, it's going to have a slower reload and more energy consumption but for the comparable energy consumption and reload you can just use the Neodori 3 and do more damage uh, Neodori 2 is a unique uh, pulse gun because it does very, it has a very very low drain and comparable damage but um, the main issue with it is that, like the Neodori 2 is going to have better DPS and it's not going to drain your energy quite as hard, but it's also not going to punch through armor as well and it's going to have, it also has a reduction in accuracy I think, if I'm correct. No, it actually has more accuracy. Okay, so Neodori 2 is actually a good option if you like it. Um, you're going to do less damage per shot, but you're going to be able to fire more often and not cost as much energy. So if you're finding yourself... Um, bodying it out on your energy a lot, then try the Neodori 2 or the Neodori 1. Uh, Neodori 1 is sort of like a cross between them. Neodori 1, 2, and 3 are all good pulse guns, and the R31 is also a good pulse gun. Just depends on what you like. Kingfisher and Knuckle are good pulse guns. So now for other weapon classes, you could easily go with heat machine guns as like an anti-lightweight because they're very reliable, they don't cost any energy to fire. 
But uh, the problem with heat machine guns is that your main damage type on this AC, the cannons, are already CE. So you kind of have overlapping damage types, which you can make it work. Um, it'll still work in some scenarios, but if you run up against, like, say, someone who has a CE shield for some reason, then you'd be kind of screwed. Uh, battle rifles are too heavy. Heat howitzers work pretty well, but they kind of overlap with the uh, with the cannons again. Rifles are a little bit too heavy. Gatling guns way too heavy. Uh, handguns don't do enough damage. You could make it work with a particular type of handgun, the Akagiri models. Uh, one and two are both very good weapons. They do decent damage, although they have somewhat limited ammo capacity. So these are more for finishing off targets. And since the uh, heat cannons have limited ammo capacity, you're not going to be able to. You might run out. You might run into situations where you run out of ammo both for the heat cannons and your main weapons. Shotguns will work because they overlap with the short range of the heat cannons, and they also do pretty good damage. So shotguns will work. Uh, the only problem is that you have to figure out how to make them fit because the shotguns are a bit heavier than like these pulse guns. So you just figure out how to make them fit. You'd have to. You'd probably have to reduce some of the armor to get shotguns on them. Pulse, pul um, the pulse machine guns are basically going to be if you want a more consistent DPSE version. Uh, the pulse gun. Uh, for uh, for models you would choose, you'd probably go for the. Uh, oh no, I probably went over it. the Hatsukari 2, I think, is a good one. Yeah, this one is a really good pulse machine gun. It's real basic, real easy to use. Works on pretty much anything. Only problem is that sometimes people block it out. Um, I would not recommend the Yamabuki or the. Uh, Yamabuki, yeah, either the Yamabuki models. Because while they have high ammo, they also have very, very low damage. So they have they have very low damage and a fairly low firing rate if I can but yeah. So they don't do a lot of damage and they're very slow and in addition to that they're also not very accurate. Yeah. So they're not very accurate, they're very slow and they don't do a lot of damage. They have a lot of ammo, but eh. that's that's only really useful in like uh story mode where you need a lot of ammo sometimes. Uh these these pulse machine guns, the PMA series, are actually pretty good, but they're also heavy. Right? They're heavy and they consume more energy more quickly. The, the 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 good thing about these things is that they fire very quickly. So if you find someone who's not gonna be able to resist them, then you're gonna do a lot of damage very quickly, which is pretty useful. Uh, rapid tuning these actually works pretty well because they don't lose too much damage, and uh, the main gain is that the, their energy drain is reduced pretty significantly, which is pretty important on pulse machine guns because if you're holding on the trigger, every that the entire uh, the entire period that you're holding on the trigger is the draining your energy. So that's kind of important. Now, one of the models that is kind of not too popular, but is still pretty good, is actually the Kitty and the Kaleidoscope. So now, the Kitty is unique in that it has a large explosion range. It does okay damage, and it has a low ammo capacity, but it's still not bad. Um, if you like uh, the style of it, or if you like the, um, the low weight, then that can be really useful. The Kaleidoscope has further reduced weight, so you can fit that on pretty much anything. Oh, the Kaleidoscope does a little bit less damage. A Kaleidoscope does a little bit less damage and costs a little bit less. The only disadvantage of these is that for the damage they do, they have a very high energy drain. Uh, plasma guns are too heavy, laser rifles, um... Nah. Uh, you can definitely put any kind of blade... Uh, oops. You can definitely put any kind of blade weapon on this thing and they'll all work. Uh, physical blades, Murakumos will work. Uh, heat blade or heat piles... I was gonna say blades for a second. Heat piles work really well with this. Um, because they kind of bypass pretty much anything. Uh, laser blades work very well with this as well. Cannon types things, they're gonna be way too fucking heavy. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, target guns are cute. They're not gonna do anything. Jammers, same thing. Uh, shields are viable. If you want to run like a pulse machine gun and a shield, that will work pretty well. The shields will help keep you alive at mid-range. That's the main thing they're good for. So then. Now, I believe that I've gone through pretty much anything stat-wise slash optional part-wise that I feel is important for this. So, I will be cutting off this portion of the recording and moving on to the PvP portion of the recording. And uh, hopefully eventually I'll be able to do enough editing where I should be able to have the entire video in post commentary instead of having this sort of weird mix of live commentary and post commentary. So then, thank you for watching this part of the video and I uh, hope you enjoy the next part. Hello everyone and welcome. This is going to be the PvP section of the video. And uh, here we have two fights. And the main difference between the two fights is that in one of the fights I'm using the FA215 and the other fights I'm using the FSL uh, F08, I believe. Or F03, or whatever the fuck it's called. The, the, the super wide angle one that I mentioned earlier in the video. Uh, side note, in between uh, the first part of the video processing and then able to get this video, this part of the video in and edited, edited, 
I had a pizza and some cake. Breakfast of champions. So then. For this fight, this is really going to highlight one of the main drawbacks of using the Lance FCS. And that's basically just that it's a little too small to be used at the right at this range. Like it's just a little too small. It's it's close enough that if you're good, you can make it work. But it's you're making it a little bit harder on yourself than you need to. So right here, uh, this is Rogan. Uh, he's bringing he's brought dual wielding five shot sniper cannons, so he's stationary. So I get a free shot on him for about like seven thousand damage or some shit like that. Over there is Mari who is using uh, sniper cannon weapon arms and dual heat howitzers, but is primarily using the sniper cannon weapon arms. So basically I have to dance around a bunch of sniper cannon shots while trying to kill both of these guys who are fairly mobile. Although Rogan less so, but I'm focused on Mari since I know that Mari will be a lot better at dodging since he's using weapons that allow the move. And so right here I'm taking a lot of terrible shots early in this match because uh, we had just come back from playing punch bots. So I was still waking up. And so after about a minute or two of this, I realize what's going on and I stop wasting ammo and everything. I think it's like around like there where I realize I'm not wasting ammo. That was a pretty good shot but it still missed. And so it's basically getting used to um, how where your opponent's going to be in the next, uh, or in the split second after you fire. And you have to predict where they're going to be, and then know if they're going to be close enough to where you can still hit them. Because especially, as you noticed earlier on, spamming the hate cannons at medium to longer range doesn't really work real well. Also, using wall jumps is important, as it gives you a lot of speed without using a lot of energy. Right there, that was a terrible shot. Because we were both boosting in opposite directions, so it threw the shot way off. And for the most part, I'm not really going to hit most of my shots, but I only need like five good hits to kill Mari here. And same for Rogan. About five hits would be enough to kill either one of them. Right, right there, I got one hit for like five or six thousand damage. Right here, I think is where I get a bunch of good hits in. Yeah. Because Mari's stuck trying to get some, uh, get some air, and I was able to catch him and get like two or three hits in. So now another two shots would probably be enough to kill Mari if I land them both. And another two shots would be enough to kill me, although sniper cannon shots are a lot harder to hit with than these things since sniper cannons don't log on. So right here, I'm trying to get in. Mari moved. Now I have to try to get in again. Right there, had I been close enough when Mari was stuck in the water, that would have been a good time to uh, take some shots. Right there, that was one good hit. And another good hit would probably kill Mari. And I'm primarily focused on killing Mari since uh, my little uh, pulse guns on the as my backup weapons should be more than enough to kill Rogan. Especially since uh, he's not really doing much more than being a turret. He didn't bring any other weapons besides his sniper cannons. These are pretty fun fights, although these are the only two fights I'm going to include in the video for partially for the sake of the video link, also partially because all the other fights involved me killing myself by jumping out of bounds in a silly manner, or in uh, there were some conquest battles as well, but the teams that we fought were really not that great. It, would, it, would, it wasn't really a showcase of anything, like you barely see anything. Right here, Mario switched to the howitzers because he's run out of sniper cannon ammo. So the howitzers are actually a little more dangerous for me since uh, Mario can do the same thing that I was doing earlier, were predicting my shots. And since the howitzers cover cover a fairly decent spread, and they have a fairly um, and they have a decent uh, travel time, uh, they can actually sort of like block off move er, areas of movement for me. So right there, Mario killed me, and then here Rogan gets the kill. Rogan is victorious for being the turret who no one paid attention to. Let, let it be known. Pay attention to your enemies. So that was a very fun match. Pretty short, but fun. Now, for the next match, I'll be using the very, very wide FCS. And you can see how much of a difference it makes and how much it helps with this particular heat cannon. Because as you saw there, I was barely able to like almost kill Mari, but not quite. 
and I even though I used all of my ammo. Had I been more careful, I probably would have been able to kill Mario, but even then, it was still pretty iffy. I love the music for this game. So here's Rogan again. This time, Rogan is using uh, pulse cannon uh, weapon arms. So I was able to get another free shot on him again because he was standing still. Here, I was able to get a few more shots because um, he's following me very, very aggressively, flying in a straight line. And uh, normally you would not want to do that when someone else has uh, weapon arms. You usually don't want to follow people around if they have weapons that are able to kill you like two or three hits. So it looks like Mari got off a hit on him too. So now I switch targets to Mari because I feel like Mari is the larger target and I should focus my ammo on killing him. So here, low on energy, so I back up through this tunnel, so that way I can cut my booster safely and regenerate. Made sense to me. So now I'm at full energy, I run back in. After they've been fighting for a bit. Rogan only has like 5,000 health left. Mari still has most of his health left. Right here, I'm trying to get like a good shot, but I'm not quite able to because Mari's bouncing around a little faster than I can keep up with. Because Mari's very, very good at movement. Right there, had I uh, had I turned my camera towards the right instead of the left, I would have gotten that shot, but I didn't. And here is Rogan trying to kill me, and he wasn't able to quite hit me. So now I have the health disadvantage, but I also have more accurate weapons because I'm using heat cannons instead of sniper cannons. Right there, uh, all three of those shots are pretty bad. That fourth one hit, which is good. There, I was trying to start a boost. I want to cutting the boost midair for some reason, I don't know why. It's just because I was, I was fairly close. Here. And so basically since I'm using a lot of the uh, glide boost, I'm trying to stay close to platforms that I can boost off of. And then when I get close, I cut the boost and I start using my turning and jumping to get around. And that was a close shit. Uh, that was a close shot, as you may have guessed. That was a hit. That one almost killed me, but not quite. If the game lags a little bit and doesn't know whether you got hit or not, it staggers you instead. Again, I was getting to platforms that I can boost off of. Primarily just trying to get enough speed so I can get into an adv advantageous position. Right there, that would have been a good shot, but it didn't quite hit. The, 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 the main thing where this uh, wider FCS becomes important is when Mari is above or below me. Because uh, turning uh, while, you're, while, you're, while you're looking downward or upward is actually a lot less effective than turning in a straight line because of the way that rotational, um, rotational velocity works. So if someone's uh, traveling in a small circle around you, then you have to turn a lot more to, get, to keep up with them. So the, wide, the, the wider FCS helps a lot more when someone's close to you. Alright there, Mari, got a, Mari clipped me with the heat cannons. But I only need like one good shot and I still have eight shots left to kill him with. I just gotta keep trying. Both of my shots, so the first shot was too early, the second shot was too late. That one was a little bit too late. That was a good shot, but I only clipped him with half the shot. Right here, Mario gets stuck in the water, and I got the kill. And the FCS helped me get that shot, because... Had I had been using a smaller FCS, it would have taken me a little longer to turn my camera towards Mario, and then Mario probably would have been able to get out of the water by then. Or at least move far enough to, to throw off my shot. So then, that'll be the end of the PvP portion of this video. And I hope you enjoyed my demonstration of heat cannon weapon arms.